Hello, and welcome to Based on a True Story, the podcast that compares your favorite Hollywood movies with history. If you recall, last year we learned about the Steven Spielberg movie simply called Lincoln. Well, after that episode was released, I got a request to cover the Robert Redford-directed movie The Conspirator. So today, I'm excited to be joined once again by Dr. Brian Dirk, who helped us separate fact from fiction in Lincoln last year, and he's back with us today to find out more about the real history behind The Conspirator. Dr. Dirk is a professor at Anderson University and author of multiple books on President Lincoln, including Lincoln and the Constitution, The Black Heavens, Abraham Lincoln and Death, and Lincoln the Lawyer. Before we connect with Dr. Dirk, though, let's set up our game, Two Truths and a Lie. If you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'm about to say three things. Two of them are true, and that means one of them is a lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one, Lincoln was not supposed to be at Ford's Theater the night he was killed. Number two, Aiken wrote a letter to Jefferson Davis offering his services to the Confederacy before he enlisted in the Union Army. Number three, after his involvement in Lincoln's assassination, John Surratt joined the Vatican bodyguard. Got him? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, your challenge is to find the two facts scattered somewhere throughout the episode— and by a simple process of elimination, you'll be able to find out which one is a lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. All right, now it's time to chat with Dr. Brian Dirk about the historical accuracy of The Conspirator. At the beginning of the movie, we see the night of April 14th, 1865. The movie shows three different events happening at the same time. It kind of cuts in between them. One of them we're all familiar with, John Wilkes Booth sneaking up behind President Lincoln to deliver the fatal shot. The other two were probably not as well known. In one of the shots, a man makes his way into Secretary of State William Seward's house, and after killing a few guards, he brutally stabs Secretary Seward. And then the camera cuts a few times, so we don't really see how many times he was stabbed, but I counted at least eight different times that we see him stabbing him in the movie. And then the last scene that we see isn't quite as violent as the other two. We do see someone sneaking into a house. Uh, we see that Vice President Andrew Johnson is there. But then the man ends up making his way to a bar and a party that's going on in the house, takes a few drinks, and then leaves without incident. However, simply because of the violence going on in the other scenes, I'm going to assume that he was there to do violence <laughs> to the Vice President as well. So how well did the movie do showing these three different assassination attempts? Overall, quite well. I was actually a bit surprised that they included this because in most Hollywood depictions of the Lincoln assassination, they focus for obvious reasons on Booth and Lincoln. When in fact, yes, the idea was to decapitate the leadership of the Northern government all in one evening. There were changes to the details. For example, when Powell uh, rushes into the room uh, to stab Seward, it shows his daughter reading to him. That wasn't true. He had already shoved her to one side out in the hallway. The bed was against the wall. And as he was wailing on Seward, Seward kind of rolled over to once. I mean, you can pick the details apart. You know, eight times sounds about right. What the, what the, what the film didn't quite explain was... Seward had gotten a broken neck in a carriage accident, and he had this wooden kind of chest thing from the from his chin down to the middle of his navel, and Powell didn't know that was there, and he kept whacking away at Seward's chest, and the thing was just bouncing off, and he's like, what the heck? And finally, the knife broke in two, and Seward, or Powell, was like, I'm mad, I'm mad, I'm mad, and he goes running out of the room, you know, so they, they left some of those details out. But yeah, that's exactly what happened. And then in, in George Atzerodt's case, that was quite accurate. He had been given the task of murdering Johnson and uh, basically got drunk and decided not to do it. So I, I was impressed with the accuracy on that. Yeah, we do We do see uh, Secretary Seward laying in bed there. They don't really explain why, but that's interesting that that, it sounds like that almost saved his life. They really did. If he hadn't had that brace, I'm quite certain that Powell would have taken his life because he was hitting with all his might. And one thing about the movie is the actor who played um, Powell was quite a bit smaller physically than the actual Powell, who was always described 
as this big hulking gorilla of a guy. And that's why he was able to just beat people out of the way to get to Seward. In fact, one of the things the film left out was he pistol whipped Frederick Seward, Seward's son, and very nearly killed him. Um, he, he hit him with the back of a pistol as he's going up the stairs. They said part of his brain was actually showing from the injury. I mean, Frederick almost died in that injury. And Seward was never the same. If you look at photographs of Seward in the 18, late 1860s, early 1870s, the entire side of his face, because he got stabbed in the jaw as well, and the knife ripped open all of the muscles from the corner of his mouth down to his chin. And you can see that really clearly in the photographs of Seward afterwards. Wow. So, it, I mean, it was a very... Horrible. I mean, it was a horrible attack in the movie, but it sounds like it was even worse in real life. Yeah, it was horribly brutal. And like I said, I, I was impressed that the movie included that. Although, on the other hand, I was thinking, man, if somebody is not familiar with the Lincoln assassination, they should be going, what the heck was that? You know, but that's very accurate. There was a little detail in there. Speaking of uh, Lincoln's assassination, there was a little bit of dialogue that caught my attention with James McAvoy's character, Captain Aiken. He seemed surprised. He was at the party and he was surprised that Lincoln wasn't there. I think the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, says something about how Mrs. Lincoln prefers an evening of theater to a room full of soldiers. And so the impression I got was that Captain Aiken, perhaps others expected Lincoln to be there. Was Lincoln actually supposed to be somewhere else that night instead of at Ford's Theater? No, that that scene is pretty much fabricated. Stanton was actually at home with his wife that evening. He wasn't at any kind of a gathering. I don't know if we know where Aiken was actually at, but no, Lincoln had Lincoln um, had planned that visit to Ford's Theater for at least that day. In fact, that morning. The owner of Ford's Theater had put a notice in local newspapers that the president would be attending the showing of our. Yeah, yeah, yeah a real good move. Yeah, that, that's I mean, that's like violating security 101 today. You don't do that. But that's how everybody knew he was going to be there. The, the real circumstances were that Mary almost actually tried to beg off the trip to the theater at the last minute. because She had one of her headaches. She suffered frequently from migraines. Uh, when Lincoln made it clear that if she didn't go, he was going to go himself. She kind of changed her mind and went with him. But no, that scene is fabricated entirely for probably Hollywood purposes and introducing the characters, I would imagine. After Lincoln is shot, and almost immediately after Edwin Stanton arrives at that house where they, they took his body after he was shot, Stanton is given the name by one of the soldiers there of John Wilkes Booth. They say that witnesses identified him since he was a famous actor. But then it also doesn't take very long, at least as far as the movie is concerned, to be given another name an intimate of Booth's named John Surratt. And that, of course, ends up leading into Mary, his mother. We'll get into her story here in a little bit. But after that, we see kind of a montage of newspaper headlines that indicate there's a $100,000 reward, and we see a bunch of the conspirators being rounded up. So all this seems to be happening pretty fast, as far as the movie is concerned, after the assassination. Did it really happen that quickly? Well, like all movies, and I'm sure you know this too, you know, Dan, they, 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 tend to, um, they tend to compress time because they have to get a story in. So maybe not quite that fast, but awfully fast. As you point out, I mean, yeah, Booth, I mean, the dude stood up in front of how many thousand people there or whatever, six of her trans, I mean, there's Booth. I mean, that wasn't a hard thing to figure out. But as you can well imagine, in the confusion, it wasn't entirely clear at first who was working with him. He uh, he got completely out of Washington, D.C., as the film uh, suggests. But one thing that the movie didn't really show was Stanton set up the investigation literally in the room next to Lincoln. I mean, while Lincoln laid, is laying there dying, Stanton is taking testimony from people coming in constantly. He, he was starting the investigation right there on the spot. The film suggest, had Stanton saying, I'm not leaving him as if it was a sentimental thing, and it probably was. But Stanton was not a sentimental man at all. He wanted fresh memories telling him what was going on. So, yeah, I'd say it compressed time a bit. But I'd say within, I, I don't know the exact timeline, within a day or two, they pretty much knew who had been with Booth. In fact, if you look at one of the wanted posters that they put up, this is within like a few days after the assassination. They had Booth, they had John Surratt, and they had Davy Harold even though they misspelled his name. I mean, they knew who was with him really quickly and because the movie's not very flattering to him, but I think you can give him credit. The man was a tireless investigator and, a, and he, he knew where to ask questions and he got those questions answered quite quickly. 
because it happened so fast, was there anybody that got caught in the middle that was wrongfully accused? They were rounding up all sorts of people. And I think you could argue that there were some people who were rounded up that probably had at best tangential knowledge of the crime. I always think of the man who was uh, holding Booth's horse, who ended up spending quite a few years in prison for simply holding Booth's horse. And there's very little indication that he knew clearly what Booth was going to do. In other words, they were grabbing people that were only very tangentially on the edges of this. But to the government's credit, most of these people were soon let go. Um, they, you know, they, they would pull them in. They, they'd say, what do you know? And for the most part, there were some exceptions, but for the most part, these people were just sort of saying, okay, fine, you're good. And they, they'd let them go. After we do see the conspirators rounded up in the movie, there is a scene where we see John Wilkes Booth and David Harold, you mentioned earlier, uh, cornered in a barn. And then we see some Union soldiers show up outside the barn. There's no communication whatsoever, at least in the movie. They just seem to set the barn on fire. And then before long, Harold comes out with his hands raised and he's taken into custody. And then we see a, a soldier, can't really identify who the soldier is, but we see him sticking a gun through kind of the holes in the wooden slats of the barn and he shoots Booth in the back. Is that how Harold was taken into custody and Booth was killed? They really fudged the details on that one. In fact, when I was watching with my wife last night, I was like, yeah, honey, this is actually not quite right. She's like, you know, honey, let's just watch the movie. I was okay, fine. Okay, you know, but uh, yeah, okay, whatever. But no, Harold had actually, they were traveling into Virginia. They had made it into Virginia, Booth was hiding out in various places during the day. Davy Harold was going out at night trying to procure them with food and medical supplies because, again, this isn't quite clear from the movie. Booth was in considerable pain from having broken his leg. They had holed up in that barn. Harold had gone ahead to the nearest village to get food and medical supplies. There was a Union cavalry patrol in the town. They recognized Harold and arrested him. And little Davy sang like a canary. And he's like, uh, yeah, uh, I know where Booth is at. I'll take you right to it. So he wasn't actually in the barn. He was with the men as they surrounded the barn that he was fingering Booth. Then, you know, they, they actually went through a considerable negotiation process. Uh, the commander of the cavalry said, hey, Booth, you know, you're in there, man. Come on out. Okay, it's over. And Booth was trying to buy time or something. He's like negotiating. And they, and they finally just got tired of it. He's like, oh, fine, this is the thing on fire. He's going to believe we do that. And they lit the thing on fire. And the, uh, the soldier who uh, pulled the trigger, uh, by the way, is a man named Boston Corbett. I'm not even making that name up, okay, who has a very interesting life. I won't go into it here, but go Google Boston Corbett. You're going to go, whoa, you know, but Corbett looks between the cracks of the boards and kind of like the movie showed. So you could see Booth hopping around on his crutches trying to put the fire out and he drew a bead and shot him. Although in, the, in real life, he caught Booth square right in the upper chest. So he didn't give him the back end of the chest. And then they kind of dragged him out. Booth was basically drowning in his own blood in considerable pain and died on the porch of the house that the barn belonged to. So, yeah, a little different there. But I guess in some ways it kind of makes sense. They don't have to explain Harold giving up the location of Booth and, and all that. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I think the movie made decisions based on sound reasons for changing it. I mean, if they had dragged it out as long as it took, this would have been a four hour. This would have been a Netflix prestige TV series that they put all these details in, you know? So I get why uh, Redford, the director did this. I, he just, he had to compact this thing down because he's trying to get to the real story. So I totally understand it. Speaking of the real story, we do see the trial of John Surratt's mother, Mary. And even though she's a civilian, the movie shows that this trial is a military tribunal. Initially, Senator Reverdy Johnson takes the case himself, but before long, he hands the case to Frederick Aiken, Captain Aiken that we mentioned earlier. According to the movie, the reason why this handoff takes place is because Johnson suggests that Mary's not going to have a chance with an old Southerner defending her, but she might with a Yankee captain like Aiken, despite his inexperience as a lawyer. Now, something that I found interesting as I was watching this was how the movie focuses so heavily on the trial of Mary Surratt, which in some, I mean, it's kind of the the point of the movie, but we don't see much of the trial for the other conspirators. Did the movie do a good job of setting up how the trial was structured? And was Mary a key focus like the movie implies? Or was this just the movie focusing on her part of the trial and ignoring the rest of the trial for the other conspirators? To be honest with you, generally speaking, I think they did fine because Mary Surratt did garner the lion's share of attention because in an age in which 
you know, you don't, you're not accustomed to seeing women in a docket as she's on trial as a woman. And that got a lot of attention from the press. Also, the evidence for the other defendants was so cut and dry. I mean, there were some multiple eyewitnesses to Lewis Powell doing his thing. The witnesses had seen Atrock going to that bar and get drunk and then leave. I mean, they, 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 they were, they were, and, and then Harold, my God, he was literally there when all this stuff's going on. So, I mean, they, their lawyers tried to put up a defense, but it wasn't very successful. The movie did a very good job of that. Mary Surratt was sucking all the air out of the room because she was a woman. Okay. And, and from what you're saying there, it sounds like her case was the only one that actually was a case, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, you know, I mean, and I'm sure if there were experts on the Lincoln assassination here, they'd probably tend to generally agree. Although, yeah, they did try to, you know, the, the other guys had lawyers who were trying to cast dispersion on this and that witness. But at the end of the day, it was fairly hopeless. Okay. How did the movie do showing Aiken as her lawyer being kind of this inexperienced, but a Yankee captain, that w one of the reasons why he was picked by the senator to take over? It did okay. I'm a college professor. I would have given it a C plus. <laughs> okay. And again, as with the scene with Booth's murder, I get why Robert Redford, who's the director, made the decisions that he made. Okay. That said, Aiken is a much more ambivalent, complicated figure than the film seems to let on. First of all, he was a newspaper man more than a lawyer. Yes, he was a lawyer, but he was more a newspaper man. His loyalties were much more compromised and difficult to pin down than the movie suggests because when the war broke out, he actually wrote a letter to Jefferson Davis offering his services as a reporter for the Confederacy, and they never answered him. So he obviously had some Confederate sympathies. But then he turns around and lists in the Union Army. Unlike what the film shows, it's a lot harder to figure out what exactly he did in the Union Army. He was listed as a volunteer aide to a couple of units. Um, and there was a claim in, in Aiken's obituary that he had been wounded, but we're not even clear which battle he was wounded in. And then after the war is over, he was going to be tagged as one of the defense lawyers for Jefferson Davis, if Davis had ever been put on trial for treason. So yeah, his loyalties are much more much more hard to pin down than the movie suggests as this wet behind the ears union captain. But yeah, I mean, the point about him being inexperienced is entirely though true. He really wasn't a trial lawyer by any stretch of the imagination. He had very little experience with them. The movie has that one scene where Mary's meeting him going, so how many cases like this have you tried? And he's like, uh, yeah, I thought, yeah, that's probably how he would have reacted because he was, you got, you got to remember, damn, back in those days, it was really easy to become a lawyer. Okay. You could get a law degree. If you could just convince a judge, you weren't completed it. And you know, there wasn't even, there wasn't even a written exam. Okay. So he was a lawyer, I put that in air quotes. Okay. But he wasn't a, by no stretch, any kind of whiz bang lawyer that could uh, take on a murder trial. And in fact, Mary Surratt was quite quite incensed that they had given her that kind of a lawyer. That's completely different. I got the idea that he was all, you know, for the union. And because in the, when he's given that, like at first he refuses, like, I, like, how can I go against what I believe? I think Redford is using a very common Hollywood trope that you and I are all familiar with. And everybody else who watches movies that involve courtroom dramas, the lawyer who takes on the sketchy client, that's going to destroy his practice and his per personal life. But he does it anyway, because by God, we're going to fight for the Constitution and the rights. I mean, that, that could be what every Perry Mason episode that's ever made. You know, I get that. But the truth is much more complicated. And also that whole sidebar about him basically losing his girlfriend over this. He was married when all this was going on. He had no girlfriend. So, you know, they Redford's employing a, a typical Hollywood way to tell this story that really doesn't square up the facts. Speaking of uh, Mary Surratt, kind of going back back to her part, there is a scene in the movie where she ends up admitting that her son, John, was involved in a plot to kidnap President Lincoln. We even get to see flashback where we see that plot go awry. We see John and some of the other conspirators waiting to ambush the president's carriage. But apparently Lincoln's plans change. He wasn't in a carriage. So that doesn't happen. Ultimately, Mary does admit that her son did conspire to kidnap President Lincoln so he could be ransomed for all the Confederate soldiers in prison. But she insists that the plan was never to assassinate the president. How much of that is true? It actually is, although it's worth pointing out that in the movie, that is a conversation between Mary and Aiken in her cell. We don't have much good documentation for what they were actually talking about. Most of us, most of what we know comes from the court transcripts. So we don't know if Mary told Aiken that. 
But that said, yes, the early plan of the Lincoln conspirators was that they were going to waylay Lincoln's carriage on this fairly lonely stretch of road on the outskirts of Washington, D.C. They were going to chloroform Lincoln, tie him up, haul him back to the Confederacy, and then ransom him for Confederate POWs, which when you actually say it out loud like that, you kind of go, ah, that's cray cray, okay? But, and, 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 and really, um, <laughs> it was, I mean, they tried to do it a couple times, but they couldn't time it right. Lincoln was already past the point they were staying. So, yeah, the plan was to kidnap. Now, where the movie goes a little bit awry is we don't know when or why Booth's thoughts turned to murder. We just, you can't document that. At some point, probably in early 65, when the Confederacy's fortunes are really going down the drain is when he starts thinking darker thoughts about murder. But we don't know what his thought processes are. We don't know who he told that to. And we don't know what Mary would have known about any of that. But but the strictly speaking, yes, they were originally going to try to kidnap him. One of the key things that I saw in the movie is there's just strong sense that Mary's just trying to keep her son out of trouble. She refuses to turn over her son, even though that would likely mean that she would take the fall for his crime. There's even uh, a few different points, I believe, in the movie where we see her getting visibly upset at Aiken in the courtroom when he starts to try to convince the commission that they're after John Surratt and not his mother. Was she really that adamant to keep her son out of it and so much so that she was willing to sacrifice herself for him? That's some pretty major dramatic license. We really don't. We don't know for sure if she even knew where he was and if she could have given him up, even if she had wanted to. Right after the plot collapses, John gets the heck out of Dodge. You know, he's he gets out of the country. It's not entirely clear that she knew his whereabouts. Aiken, I think, at key points in the trial is, of course, pointing to her son as being where the conspiracy stops. I mean, as any good lawyer would do, he would, you know, he would see the evidence of the conspiracy and say, well, yeah, but it stops with John Surratt. But as to whether or not Mary was trying to protect him, whether, you know, that that whole mother protecting her son, which is a major plot in the movie, it's Hollywood speculation. We just don't know. Okay. But John, John did disappear and they were still trying to look for him. Like, I mean, the movie implies that. So that did happen. Yeah, um, he went to Canada, then he went, I believe he went to Canada first, then he went to Europe. The funny part is, well, funny, he ends up as a soldier in the Vatican bodyguard, and there's a photograph of him in the outfit of a Vatican bodyguard. Then they figure out who he is, and he has to flee that job, and that's when he gets arrested. And the thing about it is, after Lincoln was shot, there was this vast conspiracy theory out there that the Pope had ordered the hit on Lincoln because the Pope was mad at Lincoln and they point to that picture as exhibit A. They're like, hey man, this guy was on his body. I mean, it, it, it fed a lot of the grassy knoll JFK type theories for the Lincoln assassination well into the 20th century. What did the Catholic Church know and when did they know it? And that kind of thing. I would never have guessed that he went uh, that he, that that would be a job that you would get after. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it is. You just you look at it, you go. You can't make this up, man. And, and again, you, you, the pictures online. It's easy to find. He's sitting there lounging in a chair, wearing what, this very ornate outfit for the Pope's bodyguard. You go, whoa, really? You know. Um, but but it did actually happen. And then as the movie accurately pr- uh, portrays, he does eventually get uh, arrested and, and extradited back to the United States and put on trial but they can't convict him because the statute of limitations had run out on nearly all of this stuff. Uh, they tried to get him for murder, but he wasn't directly involved in Lincoln murder at all. Really. I mean, he was peripherally involved and he, he walks, he walks away free. Wow. There was something I want to ask you about in the movie where we see a, a character named Captain Cottingham and he seems to change his testimony. There's one point where Aiken talks to him. And he talks to him one day. We don't really see what he says specifically to him, but then when he calls him to the witness stand in the courtroom, Cottingham changes his story. And then Aiken starts to accuse the uh, judge advocate Holt and the prosecution of turning witnesses either by jail or by threat of it. Was there really this sort of witness tampering that the movie seems to imply on the trial? We don't know. Possibly. Um, the whole point about Cottingham changing his testimony is quite true. The film pretty accurately depicts that. Aiken had talked to Cottingham. Cottingham had never mentioned any kind of confession by... Um, by Mary or any of the, the quotes that he, that he later brings up. He really didn't mention that, which is why 
what Aiken calls him to the stand the next day. And then right there on the stand, Cottingham changes his story. All that is quite true. It was, <laughs> to put it mildly, a low moment in uh, Aiken's defense of Mary because the witness went up there and, and just basically eviscerated Mary's whole story. Whether or not there was active witness tampering by the military court or by anyone else, it, it, we don't know. We, we just, we really, we really don't know. There were certainly people who felt that that was the case. There were also people who felt that Weichmann and Lloyd, the other two men who've testified, that they were, that they, didn't, they were trying to save themselves. Let's give them Mary, okay? Because they were obviously involved. I mean, Weichmann was in that boarding house along with everybody else, and Lloyd literally gave Booth shotguns and whiskey and all that. And I've seen people argue that their testimony is unreliable because they got some immunity deal. They were never prosecuted for anything. So there may well have been witness tampering, but it's not documented uh, in any kind of reliable way. That probably wouldn't be something that gets documented. <laughs> <laughs> you don't go write that down. Hey, write my diary. Dear diary, I tampered with the witness tonight. Yeah, I, we don't we don't get that when we do history, <laughs> I'm afraid. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. We talked about this a little bit earlier. I want to kind of narrow in on that a little bit because it is uh, something that the movie focuses on where we see Aiken's life outside of the courtroom getting affected by his defense of Mary Surratt. You mentioned that the movie has a love interest, Sarah Weston, and there is a, a letter at the door of the Century Club that talks about how Aiken's membership is being rescinded. How was his life outside the courtroom affected by his defense of Mary Surratt? We do know that right after the trial was over, there was another lawyer that he was partnered with. It was never mentioned in the movie because he wasn't really involved in the trial, but he had a law partner and uh, their partnership dissolved right after the, uh, the trial was over. I've seen some scholars speculate that the social pressures of the trial and the notoriety that Aiken would have garnered by doing this meant their business broke up. Maybe, maybe not. We have no documentation of that. The film is doing what films do. It is plausible that he was being subjected to all sorts of social pressures and all sorts of um, informal, you know, my neighbors are looking at me funny, maybe I'm losing business, you know, but I mean, how would you even document that kind of thing? You know, um, we just don't have that level of um, primary source evidence for much of anything in that time period. All we know is that he broke up his partnership after that. And he, le he left the law not long after that. But was that because he was forced out of the profession? I doubt it. I and mean, he seems to have always had his heart in being a newspaperman rather than a lawyer. This was not at all uncommon. And it wasn't uncommon for partnerships to dissolve themselves for all sorts of reasons. You know, I wrote a book on Lincoln's law practice. He, um, he had partnerships with three different lawyers, but he had little informal partnerships all over central Illinois. They would come together to try cases and break apart. This was not that uncommon. Well, it sounds like if it's that easy to become a lawyer. Then yeah, yeah. You know. You know, I've told friends of mine who went to law school how easy it was to be a lawyer back then. They get mad. You know, it's like, man, I had to study for three years. Dude, what? what are you kidding me? You know, yeah. According to the movie, the case against Mary Surratt really kind of boils down to three key things. And they do give an overview towards the end, but we see it throughout. Uh, one of them is just her acquaintance with Booth. Another is that when she allegedly told Mr. Lloyd to prepare two rifles and bottles of whiskey for visitors, she said would be coming that night. And the last is when one of the conspirators, Louis Payne, showed up and then claimed that she didn't recognize him. They, you know, I guess it was it was dark or something. and didn't recognize him. Were those the three primary things in the case against Mary Surratt? Absolutely. The film is quite accurate on that. Although if it were me, I would put a little more emphasis on the second of the three things. The whole quote about her handing guns and whiskey and all of that to Lloyd. That probably got her hung. The other stuff. Yeah, you know, and it is true that Aiken was making points in the courtroom that, well, sure, her eyesight was, was horrible, and it really was. And, you know, he, he could have sown reasonable doubt, although that wasn't a standard. This is a military commission, but he could have sown doubts into the, into the minds of the generals on those other two points. But if you believe Lloyd, you know, and if you believe that Lloyd is telling the truth, that she did say that, and in fact, if you believe Cottingham, because Cottingham later said, Lloyd told me something to the effect of that vile woman has ruined us all. I mean, if you, if you believe the witnesses about her doing that, that's probably basically the kill shot. That's what that's what gets her found guilty. Wasn't it Lloyd in the movie where he said that they kind of distanced themselves from other people? So when she was talking to him, nobody else was around. It seemed kind of 
convenient to me that that was, you know, they just happened to be the only two there. No, there was no other witnesses. Yeah, people people defending Mary point to that, you know. More generally, I mean, there's a pretty serious divide in um, the historian's community over whether she was guilty or innocent. There's a, a, a good book called The Judicial Murder of Mary Surratt. Not hard to figure out how that guy feels. On the other hand, I know very reputable Lincoln scholars who say, no, she was guilty and these witnesses Testimony is unimpeachable. And it's also worth pointing out that Mary was much more morally ambivalent than the film suggests. She was not just uh, happened to be a Southerner. The movie kind of glosses lightly over that. She was pretty passionate pro-Confederate, as were most of the people that were involved in this. And they were pro-slavery as well, which is, I've seen colleagues who criticize this movie for never once mentioning slavery. Although I can see Redford's point in not doing that, it's not really directly germane to the trial. Nevertheless, Mary Surratt is a little more morally sketchy, perhaps, would be the best way to put it, than we allow. Yeah, the movie seems to really try to push the, the, the mother-son relationship and play on those emotions. Yeah. And the truth is, we're not entirely sure what kind of relationship she had with her son. We just don't know. You know, the evidence is always colored by the assassination and what you do or don't think about uh, Surratt or Mary or whatever. We don't know what their point of view was towards each other. We really don't. Was she mad at him for leaving her as he left or did she tell him to leave or what? We don't, we don't know. I mean, there, there, there's evidence either way and it's just hard to say. That makes me wonder, talking about her relationship with her son there, because we also have her relationship with her daughter who is in the movie and she's at the boarding house there and there's a part where I think they found like a photo of John Wilkes Booth in her daughter's room, which would be John's sister. Was there, was there, was there any sort of documentation like is this, that that was found or any, any sort of suggestion that the way the movie kind of implies like the, the daughter had a soft spot. And so if, if John was working with him, then the impression I got, you know, then, well, Mary being the mother and makes sense that she would just kind of overlook these com these weird conversations that are going on in the boarding house. Right, right. Well, I mean, it is true that Anna Surratt really, really, really tried to get her mom clemency after the, she very, very much in the movie, as it suggests, she was working hard to try and spare her mother from the gallows. That's quite true. There's no evidence about any relationship, as I know of, with John Wills Booth. On the other hand, that dude had women chasing him around the block. I mean, it's, it's if you read anything about Booth, my God, he had more girlfriends than than you can count, including um, women that were absolutely infatuated with him because he was considered to be extraordinarily handsome. So it's entirely plausible that you, I mean, and he's famous. My God, the man's arguably one of the handful of most famous theatrical people in America at the time. So you can imagine this young girl she's not that old, you know, seeing this very, I mean, you know, imagine, you know, my, my daughter's 20 years old. I mean, if Tom Cruise is coming into my living room every night, she'd notice, I mean, for heaven's sake, you know? So there's that. Um, there were some suggestions during the trial. We don't know if this is true or not, that she was actually romantically involved with uh, Weichmann. We don't know if that's true or not. The movie, I think, wisely didn't go down that path because that, who knows where that tangent would have led. The movie implies that there might have been some relationship with Booth, but we know nothing about that at all. Okay. Ultimately, at the end of the movie, Mary is declared guilty of conspiring to kill and murder President Lincoln, Andrew Johnson, and William Seward. Aiken then prepares a writ of habeas corpus, calling for a retrial with a civilian court and jury of peers. And he actually manages, according to the movie, he actually manages to get it signed by Judge Wiley. But then President Johnson suspends the writ at the very last moment, and Mary Surratt is hanged alongside the other three conspirators. How well did the movie do showing the end of Mary Surratt's trial? Well, overall, again, within the context of Hollywood having to create drama and the need to tell a gripping story fairly well. Now, whether they literally received that news while they're celebrating in her cell that they've actually beat the rap, I don't think there's documentation. I mean, it's possible, but I don't, I don't know that we've got good documentation for that. But the rest is quite true. Aiken did secure a writ of habeas corpus from a local judge that was ignored because uh, President Johnson basically suspended the writ for these for all of these prisoners precisely to head off that possibility. And then there were last minute attempts from a fair number of people to get Mary off 
uh, largely because she was a woman. And the idea of the federal government executing a woman was just abhorrent to a lot of people. The timing of that also caught my attention too in the movie because it is a very much like a roller coaster. Oh, we're you know that fi- finally we you know we got this. It's going to be you know retrial, and then right there it crashes down again. Yeah, I think like we were saying earlier, I think they probably compressed the time a bit, but it still is essentially true. We touched on this a little bit earlier, but at the very end of the movie, it talks about being you know 16 months after Mary's execution, and we see her son John being held as a prisoner. Uh, Aiken does come to visit. We find out that he's no longer a lawyer. And this is when John tells Aiken that he had no idea they were going to kill his mother. He seems to be regretful. But the impression I got was more that he was not so much regretful of what happened with President Lincoln, but really just what happened to his mother. And then at the at the very end, there is some text that explains a year after Mary's trial, the Supreme Court ruled that citizens were entitled to a trial by jury. And John's trial ended up with a jury that couldn't decide on a verdict, so he was set free. Is that pretty much what happened? Well, there's no documentation for Aiken visiting Surratt. None. That whole scene is is a Hollywood, you know, recreation or fabrication or what have you. That said, we don't know what John Surratt's mindset was about all this. We simply don't know. When you know, when I watched that, and this is just me because I'm a bit of a movie buff, it reminded me of the last scene of another great classic courtroom drama, a film called Judgment in Nuremberg back in 1960. I don't know if you've seen that, but the very last scene is about the Nuremberg trials. Um, um, the Burt Lancaster's character, who's just been convicted of war crimes, is talking to Spencer Tracy, the judge who convicted him, and saying, I didn't know it was going to come to that. You know, it, it kind of felt like that scene to me. Uh, I liked the scene, actually, although that whole part of the scene where John Surratt says, here, you keep my mother's rosary. You were more of a son to her. That's pushing it because we don't know what Mary Surratt's exact opinion of Aiken was. She always felt like Aiken was a lightweight. and She should have gotten a better lawyer and more time to prepare her case. We don't know if they were personally fond of each other or not. The film seems to suggest that makes sense because Hollywood needs to tell a story about human relationships. But that's that's Hollywood fabrication. Now, the rest of it's quite true. Just shortly after this trial in Ex parte Milligan, uh, the Supreme Court rules that you cannot try civilians in a military court of law if the civilian courts are in operation, which is a landmark decision that still stands to this day. Um, And yes, as I said, John Surratt did walk on all charges. Another thing I touched on briefly earlier, we were talking about Aiken and initially refusing the job of defending. But then by the end of the movie, we... We we see a character arc like when he gets the rid of habeas corpus, he's he's still not sure if she's innocent or not, but he is convinced that the case against her is a farce and she's not getting a fair trial. And so that is the impression the movie gives is why he's fighting so hard. Did he have this sort of character arc where he started to feel like the trial was almost rigged against her? Probably. Um, hard to say. If you look at the courtroom transcripts, he's doing pretty much what a lawyer, any lawyer would do, whether or not their client is guilty or innocent, you know, um, again, when I wrote the book, Lincoln, the lawyer, I looked into this, you know, lawyers, especially criminal defense lawyers, even today aren't actually going to ask very often if their client is actually guilty or not. The point is to give them the best defense, regardless of whether they're guilty or innocent. So what we have, what we have on Aiken are mostly the court transcripts and his obituary when he passes away and secondhand testimony that may or may not be accurate. I don't know if that particular character arc is accurate, but I do think that that is the, um, I hate to use the word agenda, but that's Robert Redford's agenda. I mean, the film I thought did a fine job of walking a careful line between saying whether Mary was actually guilty or not. And I, I actually like that scene where somebody just asks Aiken straight out, do you think he did it? And Aiken says, I don't know, that's not the point. I think that's the heart of the movie right there. The movie is an indictment of the legal system for basically giving Mary no hope of getting a fair trial. I don't know if Redford has ever actually said this. I believe this is uh, a movie that he made in the shadow of the debates about what we do about um, uh, the war on terror and what we've been doing with uh, suspects from the Iraqi war, you know, Guantanamo Bay detainees and all of that. I think I think that is what is in Robert Redford's head, as you well know. You know, Hollywood will sometimes make movies with an historical content to try to make a point about the present day. 
What Redford cares about in making this movie is to ask the question, are we going to allow government to do this sort of thing to its citizens in the name of quelling fear? And I think it does a really nice job of that because I, you could watch this whole movie and wonder, even as Mary goes to the gallows, man, was she guilty or innocent? And I liked how the movie didn't come down very decisively one way or the other. We don't know. To this day, we have no idea. That is actually my, <laughs> that was going to be my last question for you. Is, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. you know, no, no, no. You're, you're good. I mean, just because the movie does that it, it, at the very end, of it, you, you don't know if she's guilty or not. And I would. Do you, is there a general consensus as to whether or not she was actually guilty today or like just looking back on it through history? Uh, you know, it, there's a huge sub literature, sub genre, maybe of Lincoln assassination books. I mean, oh, my God. I mean, it's, it's everything with Lincoln is like that. I mean, there's, there's books on his dog. OK, I mean, there's like books on everything on Lincoln. And there is a spirited argument among um, people who, like I said, there's a book called The Judicial Mer Murder of Mary Surratt. But then uh, there's a really good book by one of my favorite authors, Ed Steer's Blood on the Moon. This is an exhaustive study of the assassination. I know that my professor at uh, Rice University when I was there getting my master's, Harold Hyman, uh, I remember him literally railing in the court and in the classroom, Mary Surratt was guilty of sin. Hell, they were all guilty of sin, you know. So, yeah, no, I, I would say probably I wouldn't characterize it as a consensus. And I don't think, frankly, unless somebody finds some treasure trove of letters buried in somebody's backyard someplace or something. I don't think that we will ever know the actual truth about this. Interesting side note, Weichmann, one of the witnesses actually after he left this, moved to my neck of the woods. He moved to Anderson, Indiana, and he's buried not far from my office <laughs> of all places. Yeah, he actually moved to my little town where my college is at. Uh, kind of followed them the rest of their lives. Is there anything in the movie that wasn't in there that, that you wish had made it in? Given that you've got to make a movie that fits under two hours or three hours, no. I, and like I said earlier, I can see why they would compress the events of Booth's death, for example. I can see why you know Redford needs to get to the meat of the story. If it were me, I would love to have seen a bit more moral ambivalence uh, about the Aiken character. He's a little two-dimensional to my feeling, especially with the real Aiken maybe harboring Confederate sympathies. I would have loved if they'd done that, but they would have turned this into a really long uh, endeavor. This is the sort of thing that I think would have loaned itself well to these days, a multi-season Netflix series that you could really play with all of this stuff. But within the context of a short film, I think they did a fine job. Well, thank you so much for coming on to chat about The Conspirator. I know we were talking about books. You've written a number of books about Lincoln. Can you share an overview of your books for someone listening and where they can pick up a copy? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've, I've spent a lot of time with Abe. He and I are on a first-name basis, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, Abe's been good to me. I try to be good to him. You know? um, yeah, I've written, um, I've written to date eight books, most all of which have something to do with Lincoln one way or the other. The book most people know me for is uh, Lincoln the Lawyer. I did a study of his law practice that's sort of an overview of what he, how his law practice affected his leadership. My most recent book is called The Black Heavens, Abraham Lincoln and Death. And it sounds like a creepy topic. Um, my, my kids would always say, hey, Dad, how's the Lincoln death book going? You know, that kind of thing, you know. Um, but I, I look at his attitudes towards death and dying. I don't do much with the assassination, very little. It's mostly about how he handled uh, the deaths of his mother, his sister, two of his children, and how he dealt with all those many, many, many thousands of corpses that were part of the war. So that's kind of where my scholarship is, is at right now. Thank you again so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. This episode of Based on a True Story was produced by me, Dan Lefebvre. I'd like to thank Dr. Brian Dirk once again for taking the time to help us separate fact from fiction in 2010's The Conspirator. If you want to learn even more about the real President Abraham Lincoln, I would recommend picking up some of Dr. Dirk's great books about Lincoln, like Lincoln and the Constitution, and The Black Heavens, Lincoln and Death, and Lincoln, the Lawyer. You can find links to his books in the show notes for this episode, as well as on the show's home on the web, based on a true story podcast.com. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. And as a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, Lincoln wasn't supposed to be at Ford's Theater the night he was killed. Number two, Aiken wrote a letter to Jefferson Davis offering his services to the Confederacy before he enlisted in the Union Army. Number three, after his involvement in Lincoln's assassination, John Surratt joined 
the Vatican bodyguard. Did you find out which one is a lie? Let's count it down and start with number three. After his involvement in Lincoln's assassination, John Surratt joined the Vatican bodyguard. That is true. As Brian explained, there's even a photograph of John Surratt as a member of the Vatican bodyguard. And that photo has sparked a conspiracy theory that perhaps the Pope himself ordered the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln. Of course, there's no proof of that, but I guess there doesn't really have to be any proof for the conspiracy theory to live on. That brings us to number two. Aiken wrote a letter to Jefferson Davis offering his services to the Confederacy before he enlisted in the Union Army. Jefferson Davis, of course, being the president of the Confederacy. That is also true. As we learned, the way the movie portrays Aiken as a soldier devoted to the Union, well, there's some truth to that because Aiken did join the Union Army. But there's also a lot more complexity to Aiken since there's some evidence, like the letter that he wrote to Jefferson Davis, that Aiken may have had some Confederate sympathies himself. That means number three is the lie. Lincoln wasn't supposed to be at Ford's Theater the night he was killed. As Brian told us, the scene in the movie that implies Mrs. Lincoln decided to go to the theater instead of the party that we see Secretary of War Edwin Stanton and Captain Aiken at, well, that was made up for the movie. That just about wraps up our time together today. Before we go, the last thing I like to do on each episode is to share how much time and effort went into creating this episode. I know that's not something that most podcasts do, and that's exactly why I'm sharing this information. If there's one thing that's really surprising to most people who are either new to podcasting themselves or have never created a podcast before, it's really just how much time goes into creating them. So I figure maybe if you find out more about how much time and money goes into creating a podcast like mine, then maybe you'll start to appreciate all the podcasts that you listen to for free just a little bit more. With that said, today's episode took a total of 28 hours to create and cost $19.11 in out-of-pocket expenses. Now, as I always do, I want to make it clear that that time and cost is only my time for this one episode. In other words, that 28 hours does not include my guest time researching the subject matter we talked about. It also doesn't include the time it takes for me to do podcast-related things that aren't a part of creating this one episode. For example, the time it takes to maintain the Based on a True Story website, uh, social media, the email newsletter, and all those other little things outside creating an actual podcast episode that are still required to make a podcast. Similarly, on the expenses side, that $19.11 is just for things related to this one episode. It doesn't include all the podcast-related expenses that go beyond making a single episode. For example, the cost of maintaining the Based on a True Story website. There's a website hosting, there's podcast hosting costs, the cost of the microphone that I'm talking into, the computer, the software, all of that cost time and money. And it goes beyond things that are associated with this one episode, but they're all things that are required because if I didn't do those things or pay for those things, then there really wouldn't be any episodes of Based on a True Story at all. In a nutshell, this podcast is free to listen to, but it is not free to create. Sure, I could spend all that time trying to make money with something else, but I'm only able to spend that time and money on the podcast because of the wonderful people who are helping to support this show financially so we can keep it going. So if you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll consider helping to support the next episode over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. And as a bonus, you'll get access to over 60 exclusive episodes on the producer's feed. Over there, we look at how completely fictional movies deal with history and real life to make them seem a little more believable. For example, we've covered the history in movies like Pirates of the Caribbean. Did you know that there really was a pirate coat? It wasn't anything like what we see in the movie, of course, but it never is, is it? And then there's more. There's uh, Jurassic Park, the entire Back to the Future franchise, the entire Mummy franchise, and next week we'll be looking at Iron Man. And there's so many more. You can find out how to get access to that by supporting the show over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. Once again, that's basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. Until next time, thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon.